السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, if uh, just some of the brothers just uh, tell me that if uh, my voice is reaching everybody, um, so if you just one of the prayer people just put his hands up, his gesture just to tell me that you're okay. I just could resume, inshallah. Anybody just put his hands up? Yeah, jazakallah. So that means okay. Alhamdulillah, barakallah fikum. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى من تبع هداهم إلى يوم الدين. Indeed, all praises you to Allah. We praise Him, seek His aid, and ask His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and from the evils of our actions. From several Allah guides, none can misguide, and whomsoever Allah misguides, none can guide. I bear witness. That there is none worthy of worship except for Allah alone having no partner, and I bear witness that Muhammad is a slave and his messenger. أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وأحسن الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وبعد um, For the brothers who are in St. Albans you know that we have already started the battle of Uhud and we are studying by the way for those who are coming uh, recently to this class and joining in we are actually going through the biography of the prophet وسلم, we are uh, somehow in the battle of uhud but because we have left it more than a month now <clears throat> or almost a month we need just to make a recap because we haven't made a big start in the battle of uhud and it would be beneficial uh, to the ones who are listening for the first time and also it will be as a recap for those who had been with me uh, for the class in St. Albans. So I'll we'll start with the Battle of Uhud, as in the Battle of Uhud is the battle which basically the hypocrisy had been shown clearly to the companions. And it was the battle where the Iman as well was presented completely and it's been shown as well. So the sincerity was there and the hypocrisy on the other side was as well exposed. And also we need to learn from that battle the reasons for victory and the reasons for defeat and in, in such a battle what what in that battle in that particular battle <coughs> the um the wakul upon allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was shown as well as we're going to see and allah azza wa had distinguished between the bad and the good in that battle allah azza wa he had made a surat ali imran for that battle and when we talk about the battle we take about number of issues number one the mountain of uhud and also going to be talking about the moment when the two sides had met, Kuffar and the Muslimin. And also we need to talk about what the Prophet ﷺ did after the finishing of the battle. Um, first of all, <clears throat> the battle is called the Battle of Uhud. Uhud is a mountain which is in Medina, about three, four, five miles, three miles away from the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. And there, the battle had taken place. And that's why it's called the Battle of Uhud. And also it is the battle, uh, it is the place, the mountain of Uhud, where the martyrs of Uhud were as well buried there. And that's why when we go to Medina, we visit the holy sites. And one of the holy sites is <coughs> the graveyard, the cemetery of those who are being martyred in the, in the mountain of Uhud or in the battle of Uhud. There are 70, <coughs> there are 70 companions. Some of them are known companions like Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib and Mus'ab ibn Umayr and others, Hanbalah radiallahu anhu and others we're going to see insha'Allah. So basically the mountain of Uhud also a mountain whom the Prophet sallam testified that it's a mountain which loves us and we love it. I mean to love the battle, the mountain is okay, acceptable because we know. Uh, but for it to love us, we don't know unless Allah Azzawajal tells us through his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So this mountain loves us. So that means if mountain of to speak, it would say, I would love the Muslims. And there are other uh, as well, you know, things that would take place later on, close to the day of the resurrection, <clears throat> when we find, for example, the, 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 the uh, decisive battle between us and the disbelievers. And then when some people would hide behind the, you know, the rock and the stone, and uh, that stone would start saying, oh, Abdullah, slave of Allah, there is an enemy behind me, come and kill him. So we know for a fact that the stones, <clears throat> they, they are basically some of the, we could call them the soldiers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are one of the soldiers of Allah azza wa jal. 
Also, the Battle of Uhud one day when the Prophet ﷺ was on top of it, along with Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, and the mountain was shaking, just like a, a mini earthquake. Prophet ﷺ, he had kicked it with his foot and he said, Uhud, stay still. Why? Because on top of you, there's a Prophet and a Siddiq. Prophet is himself. Siddiq is the truthful one, which is Abu Bakr, and two martyrs, and that is Umar and Uthman. So already Umar and Uthman, they have the knowledge before they were killed that they're going to be killed as martyrs. So that is Umar and Uthman. <clears throat> the mountain of Uhud has been, uh, the, the word of Uhud, the mountain of Uhud has been mentioned in so many ahadith. Just give you one the person who has a dog, which is other than the dog, which has got a purpose of guarding, or the dog, for example, of policing, or the dog of shepherding. But he's got a dog just to play around with. Uh, every day, <coughs> I uh, uh, um, a mountain of Uhud of rewards will be deducted from his demands. So the, 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 every day, the Atirat will be deducted. And the Atirat is equivalent to the mountain of Uhud in weight. So I don't know how many Atirat you have got from the Hasanat and how many days that you need to have the dog in order that your Hasanat will be bankrupt. So for those who have a dog, well, other than the purpose I mentioned, which is the policing of dogs, or for example, the blind dog, leading dogs, or the shepherd dog, or the guarding dog, okay, uh, or, or the farm dog, you know, the, the guard dog, all of these dogs are for a purpose, uh, but uh, dog just for the sake of playing around with, it's not allowed. Right, coming back to the battle itself, the is the year before Quraysh was defeated. Because they were defeated, they wanted to take a revenge. So, so it, they wanted to make this battle as a revenge. So they gathered everybody. They gathered about 3,000. Remember in Battle of Badr, it's about 1,000. This one is three, size, the three times the size of the uh, first army. And they wanted to secure the route, which is um, to uh, Bilad al-Sham, because Manina is close to Bilad al-Sham. So they want the route, which is on the side of the coastline, on the Red Sea, to be secured. And that's why they wanted to make sure that they have the stronghold. And also, they want to uh, make sure that their rank amongst the Arab is to be regained because now Arabs have thought that oh, these people are vulnerable. How come that the Muslims, a few hundreds, had defeated you guys? So that's why they wanted to regain that reputation of theirs. <clears throat> the Prophet وسلم, he had seen a vision, and the visions of the prophets are to be revelation, in which he had seen that he had shaken his sword and it was broken. And he had interpreted that this is what happened to the believers on the day of Uhud. Then he had shaken it again, and it came back as it was, as in good shape. And this is what happened later on after the battle. And uh, Prophet ﷺ, when he had heard about these enemies preparing, so he started to uh, ask the companion what they should do. I mean, Prophet of Allah, he was uh, uh, of the opinion to stay in Medina and use the Medina as a place for uh, basically gaining the edge over the kuffar, because when they come in between the alleys, even the women could really help and you know, send rockets, uh, or rocks, so we can say rockets. They would they drop rocks onto the enemies. So everybody will be helping, because when the enemies go into the Medina. So that was his opinion. Um, so the Ansar didn't really like that, and they said, Messenger of Allah, we never let in any enemy to come to us inside the Medina, that's before we embrace Islam. Now when we embrace Islam and we are powerful with this Iman and faith, we're going to let an enemy to come onto our side. So the Prophet said, okay, this is your business. If you want, okay, we'll go and meet them. Of course, the hypocrites were with the opinion of the Prophet of Allah. The reason behind this, that uh, they will stay at home and they will not fight. So that nobody would know that they have participated or not. So they were with the Prophet of Allah in that sense. So when the Prophet said, okay, so he put his uh, armor, which is the uh, the battle and the fight and all of that. Um, he left and the companions said to each other, the Ansar, well, maybe we made a, a, a wrong mistake here, a mistaken decision. Let's just go and tell the Prophet of Allah that you know he could choose whatever he likes. The Messenger of Allah, maybe we have prevented you to choose what you want. Um, so if you want, we will uh, fight inside the Medina. So the Prophet said, he said, when the Prophet puts his armor on, that means he's ready, he will not go back. Prophet Sallam, he left after Asr on the day of Jumu'ah. And the year is three after Hijrah. The month is the month of Shawwal. And as of the date, the date of this, this, uh, 
disagreement among the, the, the scholars and historians, it's the 15th of Shawwal. So it's about a year and a month exactly after the Battle of Badr. Uh, on the way to Uhud, only three miles, third of the army went back, headed by, of course, the head of the hypocrisy uh, and the hypocrite Abdullah ibn Ubayd al This man, he just took a third of the army. He did not go in the beginning. He went with them. But he wants to basically to put some sort of, um, uh, I, would, I would say, lower the encouragement and the courageousness of the companions by doing such a thing. He pulled a third of the army while with him to get back. And even uh, uh, the father of Jabir, which is Abdullah ibn Haram, he tried his best to tell them, no, he's here, but they didn't listen and they went back. The excuse of that, they said, well, there is no fight. Why should we go? That's the excuse. And Allah Azza wa exposed them in Surah Ali Imran. And that's the first, as I said, benefit we can get that the hypocrites were shown to everybody. Because they said an, a something which is not correct. They said that there's no fight. If there's a fight, we would have been coming along, but there's no fight. They're not going to come this Quraysh. So Allah Azza wa Jal, He had said that these are hypocrites. And Allah exposed what's in their hearts. And also, and also let the ones who are know, you know that these people are hypocrites. And when they just said to them, come and fight in the sake of Allah, and uh, uh, they said, well, if we knew that there's a fight with a fault, Allah Azza wa he said, they are close to the kufr, the disbelief, they are, the rather than they are closer to the iman. They say with their, with their mouth, what is not is in their heart. Right. Now, regarding those who had pulled away, companions had two opinions regarding them. Should we kill them or should we leave them? And Allah Azza wa Jal told them in the ayat that you should not really uh, let them, they should not kill them for verily. Allah Azza wa Jal will humiliate them. And Allah's Messenger, he said, how can I kill my companions? Meaning, they look like Muslims because they're hypocrites. Remember, they look like Muslims, but inside they're kuffar. And this incident had affected some of the Muslims. And this is what the target of the hypocrites. Some of the Muslims are true Muslims. They were as well hesitant. And they said, okay, we'll just go back. There's no fight. And these are the two tribes, which are Banu Haritha and Banu Salama. Banu Haritha and Banu Salama. Now, they are from the Khazraj and Aus. Banu Haritha is from Al Aus, and Banu Salama is from Al Khazraj. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal sent a verse regarding these two tribes. He said, "In Hamat Taifatan Minkum and Tafshala, Allah Waliyuhum." Two groups almost had failed, but Allah Azza wa Jal helped them, gave them at Waliyuhum. Wali that means you are a close companion. So Jabir ibn Abdullah, who is from the Khazraj, he said, "Verily, we don't have any hatred towards this verse that has been revealed about us. That means it's saying that it is us, the one who is about to be failing." Because at the end of the verse it says, Allah is our wali. So we are happy that that verse has been revealed. We have no what sort of a, a rejection or being denying or not accepting this verse. This verse is beautiful for us, even though it states that we are we were about to fail. Because Allah said at the end of the verse that Allahu waliyuhuma. Allah is his his helpers. Now, basically, now we come to where the Prophet Sallam lining up now the companions to confront the kuffar. And as I said, it was the third year of the hijrah, the month of the shawwal, and the day is the fifth. Wallahu alam is the closest to the historians, as I said. And he as well checked if everybody is uh, 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 valid in for, for, for fighting. Because if you are younger, you're not allowed to fight. If you're a child, you're not allowed to participate. If women as well, they're not allowed to participate. So Abdullah ibn Umar, he said, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he saw me in the day of Uhud. And I was 14 years old. So he sent me back. And he said on the year, which is five after Hijrah, in the Battle of the Trench, he allowed me okay, to come in. Because it, if you have to finish 15 years, you have to be up to the 16 years old in order to participate. You'll be an adult in order to participate. I'm asking the question now, the one who left to come, of course, is his father, Umar al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. I'm asking what type of men, subhanAllah, they would allow, not allow, they would encourage their children to come along with them to fight for the sake of Allah. Now, the Prophet, sallam, he had, okay, 700. There were 1,000, remember, 
about a quarter of one, you know, 300 went back for the hypocrites. We've got 700 mujahid at the moment. They are going to face 3,000. The 700, they haven't got the same as in terms of horses, in terms of armors, in terms of weapons. They don't have the same as the 3,000 of the kuffar. Right. Now, the Prophet he had a strategy. It was a, the mountain, okay, and these kuffar are coming from the side of Mecca. The Prophet وسلم, he's having the mountain of to protect them from one side because it's really big height. And he doesn't want the Quraysh to go from behind the mountains and come back to the back of the army of the Muslims. So what he did, he placed on a high place here, 50 archers, 50 men equipped with the archery, the bow, the, the arrows, in order to protect that if anyone from the Kuffar to come from the other side, they will back them off. They can't come from the back of the Muslims. And he made Abdullah ibn Jubair is to be the leader. The 50. Those are the 50. And he said to them clearly, don't leave this mountain. Even if you see us to be defeated, don't come and help us. And even if you see us to be victorious, don't come down and share and participate with us. Just stay put until I give you the uh, approvement uh, and approve for you to come down. So you stay there. And the Prophet وسلم, he started now lining up the companions and he held a sword and he said, who amongst you is going to take the sword with its due right? Well, at the beginning he said, who's going to take the sword? And they said, then I mean me. He said, no, with its due right. So, companions, a bit, what is the due right of it? Abu Jajan said, Messenger of Allah, give me it. I'll take it with its due right. And he didn't know it was a due right. That means you have to use it to kill so many people in it. So Abu Dujana, he had taken it and he had proved that he had taken it with his due right. And he had killed so many from the idolaters. Abu Dujana, he was a courageous man. He was a person that he even, uh, subhanAllah, he used to walk with pride in front of the disbelievers of the idolaters. The Prophet Allah, he said, and he had as well a red bandit on top of his head. So the Prophet of Allah, he said, verily Allah hates such a walk, except in such a time and such a place. Because this walk is arrogant. Allah hates this walk, except in such a place in such a time, meaning in front of the enemies, to scare them off. And that's what Abu Dujana was doing. Uh, a man in the battle, he said, Messenger of Allah, if I was to be killed, where am I going to be? So the Prophet وسلم, he said, you're going to be in Jannah. He had some dates with him. He said, well, it's a long life for me to eat these dates. He came and fought with the Prophet Allah until he was killed. Right, now, this is the day, as I said, we're gonna, they're going to meet with each other, Kuffar and the Muslims. What happened is that as soon as this fight started, okay, usually the, the Battle of Badr, there was a single combat, but there's no single combat here. It was just a fight straight away. Asadullah Hamza, this is the title, uh, Hamza. Asadullah, he was straight away heading towards the one who was holding the banner of the Kuffar flag, and he went to kill him. And then after that, there's another person who came and put it up. Because if that is down, the morale of the army will go down with it. So another person held it until nine people, all of them they were killed by the Muslims. Abu Dujana with the sword, which he had taken from the Prophet, he had as well started to harvest heads of the disbelievers. And Hanbala radiallahu anhu, that's the Hussein Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is from the, lead, the leader of the Kuffar, the leader of Shikim, before he embraced Islam. He saw Abu Sufyan and he said, this is my opportunity. And he just lifted up his sword. He wanted to kill him. One of the mushrikeen saw him from the back and came and stabbed him and killed him. For a hikmah, for a wisdom, Allah wanted it. That is Abu Sufyan later to embrace Islam. Hamdallah was killed. Allah Hamdallah, when he was killed, Prophet he had seen something. Uh, Allah has given him that. That Hamdallah was being taken by the angel and giving him a wash between heavens and earth. Prophet Allah has been given that vision to see. This Hanbalah was being given a wash. SubhanAllah. Straight away, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked, can you ask the wife of his, what, 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 what is this? What, what, what happened? So she said, and she, she told this message to, to, to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She said, basically, he left me and he was with, you know, marital relations. So he was in Janaba. And as soon as he heard that, the, the call for jihad, he left, he didn't have time to wash himself. SubhanAllah. And he participated in the battle and he was killed. And that's why the angels gave him a wash. 
That's why the Prophet that's why the angels gave him a wasif. Because you know that the martyr in the battle is not allowed to be washed. Okay? Because his wounds will be exuding fragrance on the day of resurrection. But this one, because he had was he died on a janaba, the wash was being given not by human beings, it's a different wash, uh, different type of water by the angels because of that man, Radiallahu Anhu Arba. Tayyib Hamza radiallahu anhu, now he is the one who is harvesting and he's even with his swords. Now there was a person called Wahshi. Wahshi, he was promised his freedom if he's to be killed, if he to kill Hamza. So Wahshi, radiallahu anhu arda, he came with the kuffar, nothing to participate in the battle. His mission is to kill Hamza. Why? Once he wants to gain his freedom. He was a slave. So he said, I saw him. He's like a camel between the enemies and his feet. You know, and I, I hid myself. And when I hid myself behind a stone until I saw him, that he is at the moment busy, not looking at me. I took my javelin, my spear, and I shook it, and I threw it, and he's a master in that. And that javelin went inside his belly and then between his legs. And he said that maybe that's it. Oh, that's, it's a fatal blow. And then he left him. This is what happened, and he did not participate in the battle, and he left. Now, the Muslims still winning. Even Hamza and al was killed, was martyred. The Muslims still winning. And the Kuffar, they have been scattered. They, they, every time they hold their banner up, they were to be killed. And basically, that even the women who came along with the Kuffar, one of them is Hind, the wife of Abu Sufyan. When she saw that these people are running away, they were telling them, come on, stay still, stay still. They didn't. Not only that, they started climbing, okay, the mountains. And uh, one of the companions, he said, I have seen even the khalakhil. Khalakhil is the anklets of the women, the bangles, put them on their legs, okay? I have seen this khalakhil of these women because they're running from the Muslims and also all the kuffar are running. So Abdullah ibn Abbas, he treats this as a victory. He said, hmm. The Muslims never gain any victory more than the victory in the day of Uhud. And he used to say that my proof for that, Allah saying, Allah had fulfilled his promise to you when he made you to go and kill them and harvest them in multitude numbers. Now, this is now, I would say, total victory of the Muslims at the beginning of the Battle of Uhud. Now, when these kuffar left and left behind them all booties and all of that, this is the mistake that has been done by the uh, 40 of the 50 archers whom the Prophet Allah placed them to protect the back of the army. They saw their brothers in pursuit of the Kuffar and Khalas, the battle is finished for them. Some of them, they said, okay, the war booty, the war booty. Abdullah ibn Jubayr, who was the leader, he said, did you forget what the Prophet Allah told you? That we should stay popped, we can't leave. They said, no, no, you're mistaken. Let me do an interpretation here. That the Prophet وسلم, he wanted us to protect the back of the army until they gained victory. And they have gained the victory now. So we go and as well share our brothers in this war booty. Forty of them went down. Ten stayed. Who's watching here? Khalid ibn Walid radiallahu anhu. Khalid ibn Walid, he, oh, he himself as well, he was running away as well like the Kuffar, but he was a commander, experienced in the war. He was on the side of the kuffar this time. But when he was running and he saw this, ah, the mountain is exposed now. So he took, okay, or the cavalry with him, the, the ones which are knights, the ones who are on horses, and he turned behind the mountain and he went to those 10 who are remaining. He killed them. They killed them. They couldn't really protect because there were only 10, not 50. And then they started now fighting the Muslims from the back. They didn't expect there would be somebody from the back. Iblis, may Allah curse him, as in the hadith says, he started shouting and screaming, oh, slaves of Allah, look at your back. When they looked at their back, some of the Muslims were going forward and some of the Muslims had heard the call and went backwards. So Muslims had faced Muslims, we call it friendly clash now. Huh? That means Muslim killing Muslims. Even Hudayf ibn al-Yamar, his father, was killed in this friendly clash. Muslims had killed his father, and he was saying, this is my father, this is my father, because you know, there's chaos taking place. Now the Prophet 
when he looked at his companions are, you know, not really in, in order. So he started saying, oh, slaves of Allah, come to me. Soon as he said this call, the kuffar had heard his voice and they realized that this is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said he wanted to come and kill him. So they made their effort to surround him and kill him. Allah Azza wa Jal, he had sent angels to protect the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And still, even with that, some of the kuffar managed to get inside and do some harm to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They got to him and he was only with seven from the Ansar surrounding him. And the Prophet was saying he was going to be protect me, uh, uh, Allah Azza wa will make him my companion in Jannah. So they killed, they were fighting until they killed, they were killed one after the other. All these seven were, okay, killed. Jibra'il, Salam, and Mika'i were sent also by the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to make sure that the Prophet Sallallahu would not be killed. Yes, be wounded, but not to be killed. Sali Waqas, he said, verily on the day of Uhud, I have seen two men and they had white clothes and they were fighting for the Prophet I've never seen them before or after and that means Mikael and Jibreel Jibreel Aysalim and Mikael alayhi salam Sadri Waqas radiallahu an is a man who's very skillful in throwing the arrows so he started with his arrows and out making the Bushliki to back off and the Prophet he said Irmi Sa'ad fi daka abi wa ummi come on throw Sa'ad your arrows I sacrifice my father and my mother for you and the Prophet of Allah, he had sacrificed his father and my mother only for him and also for Az Zubair and Al-Awam radiallahu I sacrificed my father and my mother for you. And this means sacrificial of the father and the mother means you, know, you, are, you are a good person. Now, is it allowed for me to say, I sacrificed my father and my mother for you, my dear brother? No, it's not allowed. Uh, we could say to the Prophet, I sacrificed my father and my mother for you, Messenger of Allah. But I can't do it to anybody else. And the Prophet of Allah, he had done it only for two companions. As I said, for this and the other person. And that is a Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu anh. Abu Talha, that was the day of Abu Talha radiallahu anh, uh, he started defending the Prophet sallam, with his chest. Uh, subhanallah. And every time there was companions, some arrows, he would say, give these arrows to Abu Talha. Let Abu Talha start throwing. And Abu Talha would throw with his arrow and the Prophet of Allah would start looking where is the arrow had landed. And he would tell, okay, Abu Talha. And Abu Talha said, Messenger of Allah, do naka means be careful. Oh, I don't want any arrows to come to you. My chest is a protection for your chest, Messenger of Allah. Yet with this bravery, okay, the Prophet had some injury. His Raba'iyah, the two incisors, okay, they were broken. Also, that the blood had dripped onto his face and also he had fell into a ditch and because of that two of the chains okay or maybe one of them halqa that is it went inside his cheek now the one who had taken it from his cheek is and uh, uh, he had taken it and basically with his tooth why he didn't take it with his hand because he wanted to feel the pain in his teeth just like the pain is in his in the cheek of the Prophet. When he pulled it out, his two inside of it as well went out with this with this uh, chain that went inside his cheek. And uh, he started seeing instead of saying the scene, he said, Teen, teen. And the Prophet said, Nobody is better than teen than him. Anhu arba. So he took it with his cheek. He said, The companions. Now the Prophet, as soon as he seen this. He made a supplication against the kuffar and he said, How can these people be successful? I mean, in this dunya, they're going to be going to paradise. How can they be when they're still alive? Uh, when they have uh, cut their prophet. And Allah Azza wa sent a verse, which is in Surah Ali Imran, verse 128, It is not for you, Messenger of Allah, to decide their fate whether they're going to become a kuffar or a Muslim. Oh, you are, you know, maybe Allah will uh, make them to repent or he would punish them. Anyway, it was made as a rumor amongst the companions that the Prophet وسلم, was killed. So the, the companions were in sort of extreme sadness. You know, they, were, they don't know what to do. And uh, basically, it was a defeat. On top of that, now they have heard a rumor. 
that the Prophet was killed. Now the Prophet he had pulled backward with the people or the companions who were with him. And the Messenger of Allah وسلم, he had ended up in like a valley, Shib, okay, which is the same valley that he was at the beginning in it. The Kuffar, they failed to basically uproot the Muslims and finish this battle and make a decisive decision. They failed to do that. Abu Sufyan, he didn't want to follow because he was scared what's going to happen. Now he's satisfied with the victory that he's got. So he started now, okay, uh, to call upon them and say to them, anybody, is, is it Muhammad amongst you? Afikum Muhammad? So the Prophet said, you don't answer him. So he said, in you, amongst you, Abu Ibn Abi Quhafa, means Abu Bakr. And when you call him by his father's name, that means you are belittling him. Amongst you, the son of Abu Quhafa, said, then he said, amongst you is the son of Al-Khattab, which he meant Umar Al-Khattab. But when you say the son of Al-Khattab, that means you're belittling that person. So the Prophet he did not, he said, don't answer him. Just to tell you who are the most important people amongst the Muslims, according to the Kuffar, that is the Prophet of Allah, then Abu Bakr, then Umar. Okay? He didn't say, amongst you, Ali ibn Abi Talib is a young man. Amongst you, only one companion. It's meant because these are the main, main three people. If the three people are gone, Muslims will have no Islam. <coughs> amongst you, Muhammad, don't answer him. Amongst you, Abu Bakr, don't answer him. Amongst you, Umar, don't answer him. Then Abu Sufyan, he said, okay, they're being killed, those. They now because they didn't answer him. Okay, uh, they were killed now. So when he was said, they were killed, uh, straight away, Muhammad, he did not really hold himself. He said, no, no, you're a liar, enemy of Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal had made some people stay to make you be disgraced. There are still people here to make you disgraced, okay, and to make you as well humiliated. Abu Sufyan, he said, make Hubal, which is one of the guards, to be the uppermost. The Prophet said, Pasah. Messenger of Allah, what should we say? He said, Kulu Allahu a'la wa ajal. Say, Allah is greater and He is more exalted. He's exalted, more exalted. Abu Sufyan said, Lana al Uzza wa la Uzza lakum. We've got a Uzza. Uzza means the might. When you have no might for you, Abu Sufyan said, Answer him. So what we should we say? He said, Allahu maulana wa la maula lakum. Our Allah is our Lord, He's our protector. You have no protector. Abu Sufyan, when he said, Yawmun bi yawm. Yawmun bi yawm Badr. This day is a revenge for the day of Badr. Wal harbu sijal. And the fight is, you know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. What are you doing? You're going to find some mutilation. Mutilation taking place. I did not command it, but yet I'm not unhappy with it. So I did not command for that mutilation, but I'm not unhappy. I mean, it doesn't really make me unhappy because you are my enemies anyway. So. Now, this is what uh, Umar Khattab he said. He said, no, it is not equalizer. It is not an equalizer. For verily, your dead people are in fire, in the hellfire, in hell, and our dead people are in Jannah. Yes, the Kuffar had mutilated the bodies of the Muslims. We find, for example, Hamza ibn Abdul Muqtadr has been mutilated. We don't have a proof that him, the wife of Abu Sufyan, had entered her hand into the belly and took the intestines of Hamza ibn al-Muttalib because he's the one who killed her okay, father and her as well brother uh, and her uncle. So we don't find that uh, as to be truthful. But regardless, if, it's, if it is, it was at the time when she was a kafir, the wife of Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anha now, Hind. So, but we don't find that, that she had taken his liver and she chewed it. Also, that is not authentic. It is not in the main books of the Sunnah. Right. Now also they have mutilated Anas ibn al-Nadr, they made him into pieces. Even his sister did not recognize him except by his, by his finger. Uh, that's my brother, because he was mutilated. Now the Prophet Sallam, what did he do after this battle? When the Kuffar left, and they did not, as I said, made a decisive win, they considered it as a win, but it's not a decisive win, and they did not kill whom they intended to kill, which is the Prophet of Allah, Abu Bakr and Umar, Yes, but Allah Azza wa Jal made the Muslim to taste a, basically some sort of defeat to teach them a lesson, okay? And the Prophet Sallam, when this taken place, he had raised up his hand and he made a dua. Allahumma laka alhamdu kullu. 
O Lord, to you belong all the praise. Allahumma la qabida lima basat. There is no one to hold what you have extended. Wa la basita lima qabat. No one to extend what you have held. Wa la hadiya liman adima adlalt. And no one to guide whom you have misguided. Wa la mudilla lima hadayt. And no one to misguide whom you have guided. Wa la mu'tiya lima manat. And no one to give whom you have prevented. Wa la mani alima a'tayt. And no one to prevent whom you have given. Wa la muqarrima la bima ba'at. And no one to make something closer for something that you are already have made it far. Wa la mu'ida lima qarrab. And no one to make something far with something already you have made it close. Allahumma afsat alayna min fadlika wa rahmatika wa rakatika wa rizqik. O Lord, open your gates for your virtues, for your rahmah, mercy, and for your barakah, blessings, and for your rizq, provision. Allah min yasaluka al-na'im al-muqeem. O Lord, I ask you, the everlasting blessings, alladhi la yahulu wa la yazul, the one who does not change and does not remove or does not perish. Allah min yasaluka al-awna yawm al-qilah al-faqa. I ask you, O Lord, the help on the day which we are in need. وَالْأَمْنَ يَوْمَ الْخَوْفِ And the security when we are in fear. اللَّهُمَّ إِنِّي عَيْذٌ بِكَ مِنْ شَرِّ مَا أَعْطَيْتَنَا وَشَرِّ مَا مَنَعْتَنَا O Lord, I seek refuge in you from the evil of what you have given us or from the evil of what you have prevented us. اللَّهُمَّ حَبِّبْ إِلَيْنَا الْإِيمَانَ وَزَيِّنُهُ فِي قُلُوبِنَا O Lord, make this iman, the faith is to be loved in our heart and make it to be adorned in our hearts. وَكَرَّهِ إ and al-isyan, this disobedience to be hated into our heart. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنَ الرَّاشِدِينَ And make us from the ones who are guided. جَعَلْنَا وَتَلَهُمَ تَوَفَّنَا مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ Allah, Allah, to make us die as Muslims. وَأَحْيِنَا مُسْلِمِينَ And make us live as Muslims. وَالْحِقْنَا بِالصَّالِحِينَ غَيْرَ خَزَايَ وَالْمَفْتُونِينَ And make us to act up with the righteous people which are not to be humiliated and not to be as well in trials. Allahumma qatil fight and kill those who are kuffar, disbelievers, and they are the ones who are mis-evil doers. الَّذِينَ يُكَذِّبُونَ رُسُولَكَ The ones who are belying your messengers, يُسِدُّونَ عَنْ سَبِيلِكَ And they are hindering from your path. وَجْعَلْ عَلَيْهِمْ رِجْزَكَ وَعَلَى لَكَ إِلَهَ الْحَقِّ And make your punishment and your chastisement upon them, O Lord of the Haqq, the truth. اللَّهُمَّ قَاتِ الْكَفَرَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ إِلَى الْحَقِّ O Lord, fight and kill those kuffar from the people of the book, O Lord of the truth. Fight. The Prophet وسلم, after this, he started now counting how many people have been killed. And also, he had seen some of the Muslims carrying their deceased, the ones who have been killed as a martyr, back home to the Medina. So the Prophet وسلم, he commanded for a person to call that your deceased is to be buried where they were killed. So all of them they were killed in that place, which is in the place of Uhud. They were about to take it. So he said, no. Shuhada cannot be taken. They have to be buried where they were <coughs> killed. These are the difference as well between the, the shaheed which is in the ma'araka and the shaheed which is from the plague or the shaheed from the belly or the shaheed from the pest or the shaheed. All of those, they have to be washed and they have to be shrouded and they have to be prayed upon. And they have to be buried in the Muslim cemetery, not to be buried where they die because of the plague, for example. This is the difference as well. Whereas the, 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 the normal shaheed, which is the proper shaheed in the battlefield, uh, cannot be washed. Uh, as for shrouding and for prayer, it's an optional, which is not compulsory. You could as well bury him without shrouding. Just to make it easy, let me imagine we've got lots of shaheed martyrs. It's going to take a long time. It's going to be easy us to go and wash him and shroud him and pray upon him. We don't have time because the enemy will might kill us as well. That's why Allah made it easy for us. And not only that, to bury in one grave more than one person, three, four people, on top of each other, next to each other, but in one, one hole. Like what, one, two, three, four, five, six. Because as I said, this is, uh, I would say, concession from the Almighty Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to us when we are in a battle. Mm -hmm. right. Now, that's why we say it is from the Sunnah, when a person, okay, uh, as well dies in a place, he's not supposed to be transferred to another place. He should be buried in that place, unless there is no Muslim cemetery. Prophet Wasallam, he himself was the, or the, the one who is taking authority, to make sure that these companions, the martyrs, to be buried. And he's commanded for them to be buried in their clothes, with their blood. He did not wash them, and he did not pray on some of them. He prayed on some, and he did not pray on some. Prophet Sallallahu he said, uh, uh, he said, sorry, Prophet Sallallahu he prayed upon Hamza, for example. And he made nine takbirat. And he made some of those who are being killed as well to be brought. And as well, he prayed, made them to line up behind Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib radiallahu anhu. 
Now we have hadith Jabir, which says he did not pray upon Uhud. We have a hadith Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he had prayed on some of them. Which one takes precedence? The qaida, the principle, al muthbit muqaddam ala nafi. The one who says it took place, it will take precedence over the one which says it did not take place. The one who says positive would take, why? Because the one who said positive, he had seen something that the one who said negative did not see. So Jabir Abdullah, when he said he did, he did not offer the prayer of the janazah on any, any person of the people who had been killed in Uhud, that's negation. But we have affirmation here. The affirmation takes precedence, which is from Abdullah ibn Zubayr, where he said that he prayed nine takbirat upon Hamza. Which one takes precedence? The one who gives affirmation. It's always like this. And I will give you a simple example of this. If two people came out of the masjid, and these two people are trustworthy, and I came to ask one of them, did you see X, Z, Y there in the masjid? If one of them said yes, and the other one said no, I take the word of the one who said yes. Both of them are authentic, but the one who said no, he's trustworthy, but maybe he didn't see them. But the one who said yes, he saw them. So I take the word of the one who said affirmative. Right. Also, uh, with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he had uh, buried in the command, he had commanded for them to be buried uh, three in one grave. And some of them had some shrouds, some of them did not have any shrouds. Okay. And uh, the, the, uh, also, he's supposed to be said, put them in two threes. And then he said, who is going to be first? Who was the Qibla? He said, Qaddimu Akhtarahum Quran. The one who takes the privilege, the honor of being first, who was the Qibla side, is the one who goes, knows more about the Quran than the others. Allah. Quran even honors you after you die. Right. The Prophet, وسلم, when he had buried all of his shuhada, he made a supplication. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, Oh Lord, I am a witness for all of those. For verily, not a single wound on the day of resurrection, except it will come that the same wound, the same color of the blood, but the smell will be the smell of the fragrance. Misk. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he came back on the end of the day, which is Sabt, Yom Sabt, the end of the day, the day which is the fifth of Shawwal, as we said. And he had stayed there as well, making sure maybe the enemies will not come back. So he had chosen 70 of the companions in order to go and face them. And he means to see, what are they planning to come back again? Or that's it, they left back to Mecca. So Aisha, عنها, she said, that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, الَّذِينَ اسْتَجَابُوا لِلَّهِ وَالرَّسُولِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا أَصَابَهُمُ الْقَرْحِ The ones who had responded to call of Allah and the call of them as messenger after they've been hit with this calamity of the wounds and all of that, this, you know, the defeat. So she said that uh, to Urwa, which is the nephew of hers, Urwa ibn Abdullah ibn Zubayr, she said, Barely, uh, O oh nephew, your father, okay, uh, 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 he was one of them. Abu Bakr, he was one of them. Abu he was one of them. So your father was with them. So uh, Urwa ibn Zubayr, not, not Urwa ibn Abdullah ibn Zubayr, sorry, Urwa ibn Zubayr. Urwa is the brother of Abdullah. Abdullah is the eldest. He was a companion. Urwa was not a companion. He was young. He did not see the Prophet. So said that. Urwa, your father and Abu Bakr, he's one of those people whom Allah Azza wa spoke about. They responded to Allah and his messenger on the day of Uhud. And he sent 70 just to make sure that these people, they're not going to come back from the Kufar. Now Abu Sufyan, when he went to a far place from Medina, a man came and he met him. So he said, are you going to go to Medina? And meet Muhammad. Uh, uh, he said, "Yes, okay." So, well, uh, tell him, oh, verily, we're gonna come back and kill all of you, and we will rape you women as well." So, when the Prophet ﷺ knew about this and his companion, he said the following words: "Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil." Allah will suffice us, and He is the best to rely upon. Hasbun Allah. So, you say this when something happens to you: "Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil." Ibn Abbas. Radiallahu an, he said, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil is a word said by Ibrahim alayhi salam when he was about to be thrown into the fire by his kuffar people. And also the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi and his companion said it when the people said, Verily, inna nasa qad jama'u lakum fakhshawhum. People are gathering things, so fear them. Hazadahum imana. That increased them in iman and more. Tawakkul upon Allah wa qalu, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. They said, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil. This has been narrated in Sahih. Bukhari. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give the Muslims of the victory. Now, what do we learn from this? 
what you will learn from this, inshallah. Um, the, um, first of all, how can we consider that what happened in the Battle of Uhud is to be a victory? Well, Ibn Abbas, as I said, he used to argue with this. He said, Allah Azza wa Jal. He said, وَلَقَدْ صَدَقَكُمُ اللَّهُ وَعْدَ إِذْ تَحُسُّونَهُمْ Isn't it? Allah, that was, that was, he had fulfilled his promise to you when he made you able to go and kill them with his permission. So he said, this is a victory. But there is a victory, but there is as well the defeat, which is a victory itself because the Muslim have learned from it a lot. Okay? Now, how can we learn from this? Number one, that the Muslims knew already what is the danger of hypocrites and hypocrites upon the Muslims. They're very dangerous. The most dangerous things amongst the Muslims, amongst the, uh, onto the Muslims are the hypocrites, the one who pretend to be Muslims but yet they hate Islam. Abdullah ibn Ubayy bin Salul, he is the leader of the hypocrites, who went back with a third of the army to put down the morale of the army. Okay? Uh, so this is a very important benefit that we read from this. That is to distinguish between the hypocrites and the people who are a'udhu billah and the people who are people of iman, between the sadiq, the truthful, and between the liar. <clears throat> and, right, now, the people are, uh, after the Battle of Uhud, are divided into three divisions. Kuffar, clear. Muslims, which are clear, and hypocrites, showing Islam, but they have kufr inside them. Uh, so that's why, because they are the most dangerous of the, this group, which are living amongst the Muslims, pretending to be Muslims, a kuffar actually, Allah just exposed them in this battle. Exposed them. They are the enemies. So take care of, uh, be alerted from them. Right. Uh, so the, if this is only the benefit from the Battle of Uhud, it's the best of benefits. Second one is that after the Battle of Uhud, they have realized, the Muslim, that. Victory is only by patience and by holding to the uh, uh, commands of Allah and the commands of His Messenger. Sallam, and the defeat is always with the disobedience of Allah and His Messenger and the impatience, being impatient. So, with, any, with, with patience, we will gain the victory. We have to be patient. So we know for a fact that verily that the victory is always accompanying patience. That is why Allah Azza wa commanded his messenger to be patient, not to be impatient. He said, Fasbir kama sabara ulul azmi min rusul. Be patient, O Muhammad sallallahu Like the other messengers from the ulul azm. Ulul azm, which are the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, Prophet Musa alayhi salam, Prophet Isa alayhi salam. And the fifth one is the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi sallam. So Allah Azza wa Jal will give you the victory. Abbaab uh, radiallahu an, he came to the Prophet sallam in the phase of, the, of Mecca, Mecca before he went to Medina. He said, Messenger of Allah, can't you see what is happening to us from the torture? Can't you just make dua to Allah Azza wa Jal that Allah will give us the victory? But that was just as I said when they were tortured in Mecca at the beginning. So the Prophet sallam, he was in the Kaaba. And he was shaking himself and he just sat down just to, you know, basically getting ready to say something which is important. He said, really, people before you, they were tested even more than this. There was a hole to be dug and the people will be thrown into it. And then a saw will come to cut them in half. At the same time, there will be an iron cone to take the flesh. This is first. Okay, to take the flesh away from their bodies, from their bones, the flesh. And then after that, they will be sawn in halves. Yet, that will not deter them from holding to their religion. They will be still holding to their religion. Then he said, by Allah, Allah Azza wa Jal will make this religion to be complete, to supersede, to run, and to, over, to govern the earth until you find that the person would ride from such and such, such, such places, known places where it's full of bandits. It's impossible, but because of the safety and security of the Islam, nobody will fear except for Allah and the wolf regarding his sheep, because the wolf does not care whether you are in Islam or non-Islam. The wolf will capture the sheep. But you are people who are impatient. So he told them that you are impatient. So you have to be patient. You will not again victory except with patience. The third benefit from the Battle of Uhud, that the, you know, the battle sometimes winning and sometimes losing. It's not all the time that the Muslim will gain 
the victory. Sometimes we gain a loss, but we have to learn from this loss. And this is what happened in the time of, uh, of Herakl. Herakl, okay, uh, when he came to Bilad al-Sham, Abu Sufyan, before he embraced Islam, he was there. And the Prophet وسلم, sent a letter to Herakl, Heracles, uh, asking him to embrace Islam. If you don't embrace Islam, you'll have the sins of everybody on you. Herakl almost embraced Islam, almost. But because of the ones who are around him, he backed off. Actually, he embraced Islam. He, he knew that he's a prophet. So basically, he had asked, is there anybody from that land where this person claims to be a prophet? I want to ask them questions. He said, yes. They summoned Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan is telling us the story, radiallahu anhu, okay? When he embraced Islam, what happened? So when they summoned him in front of him, he said, okay, let his people behind him. If he says a lie, let the people behind, okay, say that he had a lie. And by the way, the language was different, different language. Sufyan speaks Arabic, but Allah speaks something else. So now there's an interpreter in between. So Herakl is asking the question regarding the Prophet Sallallahu from this question, it was like, he was very clever, Heraclius. He had made a flow chart. So, yes or no? And where does it lead? From those questions, he said to Abu Sufyan, did you fight him? And it's already the Battle of Badr had taken place and the Battle of Uhud had taken place. He said, yes. He said, what was the result? He said, sometimes they win, sometimes they lose. Uh -huh. Now, Abu Sufyan, maybe according to his thinking, that maybe this is a point against the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, before he embraced Islam. Whereas this is actually a point is with Muhammad. As soon as he had finished the questions of his, and that's in itself, mashallah, lecture, inshallah, we talk about it. As soon as he finished his question, he said to him, Barely, I've asked you such and such and such and such and such. And, such. and he said to him, Barely, when he said to me that, uh, did you fight him? He said, yeah, sometimes he wins and sometimes he loses. This is the sunnah of the prophets. That sometimes they lose, but the destiny is theirs. That means that the end of it will be the winning for them. They them. Yes, in between, he'll have a defeat for the prophets, but later on, they will be, the decision is, the decisive battle later on will be theirs. Allah. That's a, a person who's a kafir, but he knows from the scriptures. And as I said, he almost embraced Islam. And I would urge you to go and read his story in Sahih al-Bukhari. In Sahih al-Bukhari. The first ben fourth benefit from this story is that it was shown to the Muslims if the Prophet وسلم, is to die, it doesn't mean Islam would die. So if the da'iyah dies, the person who calls for Islam, it doesn't mean the da'wah dies as well. So it is must upon the Muslim to die upon Islam and upon Tawheed whether the da'iyah had died or the Prophet ﷺ had died. And this is from the great benefit that we have learned. So it has actually had taught the Muslims what to do when the death of the Prophet takes, proper, takes place properly. So that was just like a, even in my foretaste, look what happened to you when the Prophet ﷺ, you heard that he had died and when he was killed, what happened to you? So this is like, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I would say like a, a foretaste. This is to teach you. So when the Prophet have actually died, they have learned from this. They should not be, you know, that say the whole khalas, we're going to defeat Islam, Islam is gone. No. So the Allah Azza He had given them a lesson with this. Also, we have learned from this that uh, so many Muslims had gained shahada, martyrdom. First one, Hamza ibn Abdul Talib, the one who was labeled uh, uh, the Lion of Allah Azza wa Jal, who was being killed by Wahshi. Wahshi, رضي الله عنه, because he embraced Islam later on. When he had entered Islam, uh, that was uh, after the regaining of Mecca. So he said to him, are you Wahshi? He said to him, yes. Are you the one who killed my uncle? He said to him, yes. How did you kill him? So he told him how he killed him. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, okay, if you're able to take your face away from me, it will be better. So the Prophet didn't want to look at his face and have some sort of anything grudge towards him because he had killed his uncle. He told him how he killed him. So basically, Wahshi had felt that I should do something to expiate what I've done. And later on, after the Prophet's death, 
at the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, there was a war, called it apostasy war. There was a person called, calling himself Musaylama, and he was called Musaylama al-Kadhaad the liar, because he claimed to be a prophet. So uh, he went with the army, and he saw Musaylama, and he killed him in the same way that he, he killed Hamza, with a, with a spear. Okay, so he said, maybe this will, inshallah, expiate my... Uh, but of course, his Islam will expiate everything. But the Prophet he didn't want to see him because maybe we'll remind him of his uncle. Second one is Anas ibn al-Nadr, the one who's being mutilated, radiallahu anh. Anas ibn al-Nadr, radiallahu anh, uh, even Salman al Waqas is a messenger of Allah, couldn't do what he was doing. He was courageous, he was charging against the enemies. He, it was found in him more than 80 stabs. Imagine, from the front, okay, 80 stabs, and basically cuts of the swords, all of that. And that's why the Qur'an had mutilated him so much, only his sister knew him from his little finger. Anas, his nephew, because Anas, Anas ibn Nadar is the uncle of Anas ibn Malik, the servant of the Prophet So Anas, very rarely, we think and we believe that the following ayah, which is Surah Al-Ahzam, min al-mu'mina rijalun sadaqu ma'ahadullah alayh, that is from the believers, who are true men. They were truthful to their covenant. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَ Some of them, they were killed. We believe this. Is for him. Some of them are still waiting. We did not change the least. So he said that I believe that this verse was revealed because of them, the ones who are being killed in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Haram, the father of Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an. Jabir ibn Abdullah radiallahu an, he had seven or nine sisters. Okay? His father came to him and he said to him, I believe I'm going to be killed from the first people who are going to be killed in the Battle of Uhud. So I would just tell you, this is my will to you, that is to look after your sisters. As I said, there are seven or nine, depending upon the narration. And we say it's nine, because if it's authentic both, we'll take the, the upper number. So he's got nine sisters. So as soon as the battle took place, Abdullah ibn Haram, the father of Jabir, he had been killed. Radiallahu anh. When he was killed, radiallahu anh, uh, they buried him with another person. His son Jabir said, ah, I don't like it. So I came six months later. I want to bury him on his own. Okay? I want to bury him on his own. And they remember, before I forget this point, that the companions, some of them had shroud, some of them did not have shroud. Like, for example, Hamza ibn Abi Muttalib, the uncle of the Prophet, uh, he, he had nothing, no shroud, but his sister, okay? He came, she is the mother of Zubair, Sophia. Uh, she came and the, 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 the um, Prophet Salami saw her from far. So he told him to go and prevent her from coming. She doesn't, why? Because he, he doesn't want her to see what happened to her brother. That is mutilation of Hamza. His, 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 his intestines is out and all of that. So he stopped her. So he came to stop her, and she just pushed him. She's a very strong woman. She pushed him in his chest. He said, no, no, I can't, because the Prophet he told me. That's why I'm stopping you, auntie. So he said, okay. She said, okay, take these two shrouds and shroud my brother with them. The two, two shrouds, the two zukwah, okay, to Hamza, radiallahu anh. What happened there? SubhanAllah. These two pieces of cloth, one is shorter than the other one. When they took Hamza, there was next to him somebody who has no shrouds. They were shy to give the shrouds, the two of them, to Hamza and leave that man without a shroud. So which one is one should take? Usually we'd say, okay, well, because it's ours, we will give the longer one, the better one. The Hamza, the shorter one, give it to the other one. We didn't do that. We drew lots between them. They put it there and they said, okay, which one? No, okay, we'll take this one for Hamza, for example. We don't know which one is which. And we don't know which one is the longer gun to Hamza or the shorter one gun to Hamza. Radiallahu anh. So they gave some of that shroud, like they cut it into pieces or something, they made half, some of it is to Hamza, and some of it to that companion, whom we don't know his name even. Abdullah ibn Haram, if you tell you the story, okay, when he came six months later, he dug him out to make him in a different grave. He said, I found him exactly the same. That's impossible, unless this is a, from the blessing from Allah. Six months in Saudi Arabia? Well, if you put a piece of meat, okay, piece of meat for six hours, okay, it will rot. 
He said exactly the same, except for something in his ear. Something had changed in his ear. Jabir radiallahu anhu, he said, when my father was killed, I started to lift up the, you know, the cloth on top of his face and start to cry. And they will tell me off. And the Prophet said, he does not tell me off. So Fatima, my auntie, she started crying. The Prophet said, said, cry, you don't cry. For verily, the angels still shading him with their wings until you lifted him up. The angel shading him with their wings until you have lifted him up. Allah. Jabir, even he, the Prophet said, he said, uh, sorry, Jabir, he said the Prophet said, he saw him while he was sort of sad after the burial of his father. So he said to him, Jabir, said, yes, Messenger of Allah. He said, why you are really, you know, feeling sort of down? The messenger of Allah, my father was martyred in the Battle of Uhud, as you know. And he left a, a debt. And he left as well children, which is my sisters. He said, well, shall I some, tell you something that will give you glad tanning about his father? He said, yes, messenger of Allah. He said, Allah did not speak to anyone except with a barrier. But your father, Allah made him to stay, stand up alive. And he spoke to him, kifaha, meaning no barrier. Subhanallah. There's no barrier between every person. When he speaks to him, there's a barrier. Your father, Allah, made him to stay alive, stand up alive, and to, he spoke to him, kifaha. And that made him happy. And then he said, Allah Azza wa Jal said to him, Oh, my slave, wish, and he'll be granted. So what is the wish? of Abdullah ibn Haram, the father of Jabir. He said, oh Lord, I wish that for you to make me alive again and to be killed in your sake again. So Allah would say to him, well, it's been already ordained that the one who dies, he cannot go back. He said, oh Lord, can you tell the people behind, the ones who are in the earth, what is happening to me? Which is the pleasure and all of this, the luxury. So Allah said the following ayat, Surah Ali Imran from verse 179, 69 to 170, Allah says, Do not think and believe that those people who have been killed in the sake of Allah to be dead. They are alive. Their souls are alive with their Lord and they've been provided. And they are happy with what Allah had given them. And they are as well hoping for those who are going to come and catch up with them. And there is no grief on them. And there is no sorrow. Amr ibn Jamuh, radiallahu an, he was a crippled man. And crippled men, you know, usually they would be exempted from fighting. But he wanted to fight. He had four sons, healthy. He said, Father, you don't have to fight. We will do the fight on your behalf. And Allah had put that down on you. That means you're not really asked and required to make the fight. So he said, no, no, I want to fight. And then he went to the Prophet ﷺ, saying basically seeking help against his children. He said, Messenger of Allah, I want to make jihad with you. And my sons are preventing me. By Allah, I'm hoping to make thee a martyr so I could enter Jannah with my people today. Allah. Prophet ﷺ, he said, as for you, you're exempted from the jihad. You don't have to do it. But at the same time, he went to his children. He said, well, if he wishes to do that, he wants to be granted the shahada, let him. So they let him. He went with the Prophet Sallallahu on the day of Uhud, and he was martyred. Now, there's a narration in Muslim and Ahmad, which is authentic. He said, the Prophet Sallallahu he passed upon him after he was killed in the Battle of Uhud. And he said, I'm just almost looking at him entering Jannah with his leg, but he's healthy. Nothing wrong. So he's already in Jannah. I mean, his soul. Abdullah ibn Jahsh. Abdullah ibn Jahsh, radiallahu an, he said, O oh Lord, I make an oath upon you that an enemy would meet me tomorrow. So they will kill me, the shaheed, and they will mutilate me, take my nose off and my ear off, and he cut it off. And then you'll ask me, O oh Lord, in what did you have lost this? And I would say, in your sake. Or verily, Sa'id ibn, Sa ibn Musayyib, he said, Allah Azza wa Jal had fulfilled the first part of his, that is, to be killed, and his ear, and his nose being cut. And we wish, inshallah, Azza wa Jal, he will fulfill that second part of his oath, that he will say to him, 
where verily, how do you have this being cut off? He would say, it is for your sin. And verily, on the last, at the end of the day, they saw, subhanAllah, his nose and his ear, has been hanged in a rope, in a string. Okay? They have done the same thing. The same thing as he had asked Allah Azza wa The Allah Azza wa had basically gave condolences to the Muslims regarding their killed ones by saying, Don't you ever believe that these people are being killed in the sake of Allah to be killed, but they are alive with Allah Azza wa they are being provided. Now, <clears throat> the, the, the explanation of this ayah, as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said, that their souls is in the green bird, and they are hooking themselves into the throne of Allah Azza wa Jal, and they are hovering paradise wherever they want. And Allah Azza wa looked at them and he said, do you want anything? They said, oh Lord, we don't want anything, because we have hovering paradise, we could have whatever you like. So Allah Azza wa asked them three times, till they saying, oh Lord, what do we need? Already, then after that, they said, Oh, Allah will not let us go until we ask Him what we want. Oh, Lord, we want to go back to our bodies so we could fight in our sake and we'd be martyred again. So Allah will left them because, as I said, He said that once you are dead, you cannot go back to life. Now, uh, I would say now this is the time where uh, we just give you, inshallah, for the questions and answers. Um, basically, uh, we will continue next Jumu'ah with this. So if you have any questions, I'm going to unmute all of you and I'll give you the capability. So please unmute yourself, uh, mute yourself first. Okay? Mute yourself. Right. Now I'm going to mute you again. But you have the ability to unmute yourself. So if you want to come, please put your, your face onto the picture, uh, if you like, and then ask the question. Fadl. Shaykh, assalamu alaikum. How are you doing? Salam to Allah. How are you doing? Everything good? Alhamdulillah. How are you? Good, good. Um, two questions from us, if you don't mind. The first one is on the topic. You just now said that the, um, the, the souls of the martyrs will be in green birds. No. Um, but isn't there another narration that says they will also take the form of birds flying in Jannah? Well, if we have the, the, one of them is a, taking the soul of the bird and one of them the soul of the bird, we know that the bird itself, the bird itself, it cannot be representing a soul. So there is a soul and there's a bird. So the narration would be better, like Abdullah Masood, he said, Arwahuhum fi jawfi, tayrin khudr. And their souls are inside the green bird. Okay. The other narration taking basically the generality of it, but now this is more details, and we always take the more details to be priority onto the one which is not detailed. Now, and then the second question, Sheikh, um, just to clarify, you said we cannot do the Jumu'ah at home if we have a group of people, but how do you explain where if we have a group of people and we do the Jumu'ah in the park, in the picnic area, in the countryside, in the mountainside, like Sheikh Al Albani used to do. How do you how do you explain that difference? Okay. This has nothing to do with the topic, but I will answer. First of all, you have to differentiate between two things. Sheikh Al Albani, rahimahullah, in his fatwa is absolutely correct. Even though some some other scholars didn't like what he was he was doing, is that he used to um, basically take the students of knowledge from Jannat al-Madina and go to the forest mountains. And then that was during the Jumu'ah time. And those Jumu'ah have been established in the Masjid al-Haram, but he takes them far away. And then he makes his own Jumu'ahs there inside the, where the desert are. And the, you know, the students will, one of the students will be Khatib. People took from that wrongly that you could make Jumu'ah between with your family and your houses. No, Sheikh would not say that. It is not allowed to make a Jumu'ah inside the house. This is a Jumu'ah which is for everybody. And the Jumu'ah is not attached to a masjid. It could be in a musalla. It could be, like you said, in a park. It could be anywhere. Okay. But now, what we have is that the masjids and the musalla and everything is to be closed. Because of the gatherings, is not allowed. The gathering would cause harm. Because of that, the Jumu'ah is not to be performed. Now, not to be performed, whether in the house or... But you say, for example, what's well, my house? I'm mixing already with my family. I've got my family, which has got my father, my grandfather is here, and my grandchildren. Now. I've got about 20 people here. Right? 
uh, more than a jama'ah. You've got 40 people. But this is not the jama'ah that the Sheikh al is talking about. This jama'ah of yours is, is in this house. You've got another jama'ah in the next house, and another jama'ah in the following house, and the jama'ah that will take from the Jumu'ah its prestige, its critic, its rule, its flavor. It's not the Jumu'ah. Okay? So if, for example, let's say, let's say, that the government did not allow it to open masjid or any musallayat. But we as Muslims gathered, we said, okay, we will take your house, it's the biggest one, is to be a musallah to make the Juma. No problem, because everybody's coming to it from that different direction. But not at this time with this coronavirus and this pandemic. Why? Because this gatherings, it will kill. So because of that, we don't need to make Juma. We make four rak'ah. That's the answer for that. And this is the misquotation of Sheikh Al Albani. If Sheikh Al Albani was alive, he would not say that you are allowed to make Jumu'ah. No way any scholar would should say uh, that you should make Jumu'ah in the house. Yes, we have some few that said this, very, very few. But the consensus of all the big scholars, like Sheikh, the big scholar now, Sheikh Abdul Masjid Al-Abbad and Sheikh Salih Hutam, are not allowed to make Jumu'ah in your house. Now, hey, Sheikh, before hey. I go, somebody had asked me to ask you, if you don't mind, somebody here in Orlando, is there a difference between istighfar and tawbah? Or are they the same thing or is there a difference? And that's the last question. Is there a difference between istighfar and tawbah? Yeah. The, the, the generality of it that the, every tawbah includes istighfar, but not every istighfar includes tawbah. Okay, generality of it. Tawbah, it had to have istighfar. For that tawbah, I didn't make istighfar. But the istighfar sometimes it has no tawbah. I'm making istighfar, but I'm not making tawbah from my sins. Okay, I'm making a step far from something else, from one of the sins, but maybe the other sins. Tawbah is different. Tawbah is more general, okay? And we say, like Ibn Qayyim had said, al-istighfar sabun al-usah. The istighfar is the soap of the sinners. You wash your hands with it. Okay, you, show, you wash your hands with the istighfar. Where the tasbih tibu ta'i'in. The tasbih, glorification of Allah subhanallah, is the perfume of those who are obedient. Now, Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Because that still exists, and is there a significance now for that well? Which well are we talking about? Yeah, there's a well near mountain of Uhud. And some historians say that it, because the, the Quraysh held it and they had upper hand because of the well. Is that true or is that not part of the hadith or is that just made up story? You're talking about maybe the Battle of Badr, maybe. That's the well of Qalib. Yes, there's a well. But there's also a well in... I've. There was a, I've seen it myself and I saw the guy, he was telling us about a story that this well was during the time of Prophet and um, the Quraysh had the upper hand because they held it first. I don't know if respect to him, he should really read from the old subject. There's no sure. will whatsoever linked to anything in the battle of Badr whatsoever. Will was mentioned in the battle of Badr, yes. Sure. Okay, but the will of, uh, the, will of the battle of Uhud, there was no will, it was a mountain there and it was, Companions were um, martyred, and you could see there. There's the martyrs. There were seventy. That's some their graves, basically there. Now, <coughs> but there's no such things called will there. Now, Allah wa Alaikum. Alaikum. Zakallah khair. Sign. Zakallah khair. Now. Salam alaikum. Salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, I have a question regarding Abdullah ibn Haram. Now. Um, you mentioned that he saw Allah without a barrier. Does that mean he has a high status in Musa al Islam when he spoke to him? High status in, in that sense, the distinguished thing, let me say, the word high status is not good. He had seen something that didn't happen to Musa, yes. I can't say high status on Musa, which is a prophet. Okay, even high status on the prophet Muhammad, if he did not see him, he had a barrier. So when he had seen him, he had seen him with the quality of the hereafter. Because you can't see him with the quality of your, because you're gonna be burnt. No companion, no prophet, no other had seen Allah the Almighty. 
But this one is a soul. Basically, he had seen him with the quality of the day of resurrection. Otherwise, he would have been burnt. Okay? So it is not that like he got his body up, the real body. No, it's his soul. He spoke to it directly, without any barrier. Okay? As to say that he's got a over status or Musa, so you can't say that. We could say that in that sense, in that sense, Allah Azza he had did something he did not to, to nobody. He said, Ma ahad. No one spoke to him like this kifah, except your father. Now, could you enable the chat, please? Can I enable the chat? Okay, yes, I'm sorry. Oh, God, yes. I need somebody as well to help me with these things because, right, the chat here, I disabled it at the beginning because when I said, Salamu alaikum, somebody said, Walaikum as salam, and I wanted just to read, to write down the, uh, basically the, uh, <laughs> The uh, the lecture, and I have lots of things, so that's why I muted it. Everything I forgot to unmute it. So now we'll see if you're allowed. No, you could see here. Somebody sent me, and I, I wanted to write down what I'm going to be doing. So I thought I'm going to leave it like this. Everybody's going to be saying salam, 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 and then the 8:15 will be wasted there. Nobody will see it. Now. How can one increase his khushu' in prayer? Now, we have talked about it in the prayer, but as a question, something different because it's, 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 a, it's a lecture itself. Khushu' in the prayer can be increased in a number of things. Number one, when you pray, you pray on something which is met, not something which is not decorated. You don't pray next to people who are speaking or, or TV is open. Okay, you are on your own. Number three, that when you are as well making your prayer, you are focused on what you're saying, you're, you're knowing the meaning of what you're saying. When you are like this, you will be flying with the words of Allah. So you'll be in tears as well when you are reading. Okay? That's what increases the khushu of yours. Also, praying with the proper sunnah, following the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when you make the ruku, when you make the sujood, following that, you are, you are striving to do exactly what the Prophet of Allah is doing. You are with the Prophet. So I look and I write to me, it's like I'm seeing the Prophet of Allah playing in front of me and I'm copying him. So I'm all, all of my body and ears and everything comes focusing on the prayer. That's called the khushu. And the khushu is uh, that basically the person forgets himself and he's with Allah. Whereas these people these days now, they forget themselves, they are with anything but Allah. They're with the dunya and how much they made and much money, money. And that's what they don't know. I mean, the they have prayed. Uh, the question here, he says, well, when will we do ahkam al is? I'm, inshallah, as I said, I may start it in two weeks on Al Khamis, Thursday. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Salam wa barakatuh. I'm dead. Yalla, I'm dead. Sheikh, let's call it um, the question regarding in the Uhud. There's a little mountain, and I was on Umrah, and the people saying uh, that 50 archers was on that small mountain. Is it the true one? Did they speak in saying that there's 50, 50 archers? Didn't they say that? 50 archers? Yeah, they said, they explained it. It says like a 50 archer was there and then they stuck from that, that small mountain. Okay, you mean that little hill? Allahu Alam. I always want to talk a it. Maybe it's this one. This is a very, very good position to show that it is close to Allahu Alam. Because if you ask these people who are Marcus and Shari Tower, which is the ones who are giving booklets and leaflets there to the people, they themselves, they're not sure. Oh, exactly. because, you see, you have to know that uh, lots of factors, uh, factors have been taking winds and flood and lots of things, you know. There's supposed to be a valley there. The valley is just almost gone. It is, it is some of it there, but it's almost gone with this construction. Allah Now, I mean, it doesn't really make it. It's not really that important to know that these are the 50 that anywhere exactly there. We have the mountain of Uhud is in front of us. Now. Uh, any any questions related, please, you could really fire it at me, uh, Ahmed. There's two questions, but they're not really related. No. The first one is asking about how to deal with children that argue back with their parents, Sheikh. Yeah. 
And this is, you know, argue back with their parents. This is this is the environment around us. That's the problem. Of course, I'm not going to tell you to beat them up. How could you do that? That's not Islamically correct. Not even as well accepted by the law. Always link things to Allah Azza wa Jal. Always. The children that argue back when they are got used to argue back, they could see arguments taking place in front of them with their parents arguing, mother and father arguing. That's when they learn as well. That's from discipline from the children. It's a, it's a very, Allah. And the father and the mother, they don't like children to argue with them. They should really say, Khalas, at your command, at your service. Say it away. But unfortunately, uh, that uh, it's a big topic, it's a big topic. But make dua to Allah and tie up everything with Qal Allah, Qal Rasul. Make them scared in Allah, fear in Allah. Now, okay, someone is asking uh, tips to prevent yourself from slipping off of the deen, and they're saying, as I feel like I'm being tested for so long, and it's weakening my faith, my iman. What is weakening your iman is not your, you are thinking that you're being tested. You think that you're being tested. Because you're focusing upon these things, which is a test. You're not thinking, you're not focusing about the blessing that Allah has given you. If you focus about the other side, you will say, oh, what, is, what am I talking about? What am I talking about? Look at the people in Gaza. They've been locked there. They can't. You've been locked now for how many days and you really can't even take it. These people have been locked for years. The lockdown on the Gaza. All the time, they can't go out. They can't. They're just in that place, the most condensed spot on the whole of the world. If, you know, coronavirus, God forbid, breaks there, everybody will take it. Everyone will get it. Okay, so I would tell this person, focus upon what Allah has given you, rather to focus upon what Allah had did against you. And what did Allah did against you is to pay for you, because this is a sin. Sorry, it's a sin expiation. The more affliction that you get, the more expiation you're going to get. Allah will not leave you walking on the earth except you are sinless. I have to be patient of you. Alif Lam Mima Hasib and Naswa Yutrak wa Yakulu Aman no Humla Yutarun. Alif Lam Mima Allah Jesus Al Ankabur. Do you think that people would be left just like to say, I'm a believer without them being tested? But you, you see, you, you're finding everything to be a test. Maybe you've been drinking tea and the tea had dropped on you. Oh, oh, another one. I'm, I'm burnt of the hand. Oh, trip. What test did you have? What is the test? You lost your money, you lost a child, you lost a relative. The most crisis that you should be thinking about losing the Prophet Muhammad. Prophet Allah said, if anybody's stuck with a calamity, let him remember the calamity of the death of me, the Prophet Muhammad. I mean, if you compare yourself with somebody who's in disaster, you'll find yourself you are in luxury. Right. Now, I've got three questions. No? They're all they're all yes no questions. The first one is Sheikh, can we go through Usul al Sunnah by Imam Ahmed Rahimullah? Can I just ask the brothers who've got some microphones on, please switch them off except for Ahmed. Again. Sorry, it was my family. Uh Sheikh, can we go through Usul al Sunnah by Imam Ahmed Rahimullah? That's the first question. Can we go where? They want to go through the book review of Imam no, Ahmed. No, no, I've done it, you said done it three, four times. Alhamdulillah, it's no. recorded. Next question Do you do lessons in Arabic? What do you mean Arabic? Quran or Arabic? No, I think they're asking for lessons in Arabic language, Sheikh. Man, Arabic language, oh, okay. Because when they say, our brothers from Pakistan, they say, we say Arabic, that means I've got a lesson in Arabic, that means I've got a lesson in Quran. Arabic language, no, I mean, there's plenty of teachers now, alhamdulillah. No. I, mean, I mean, I think they mean that you teach, but you teach in Arabic. Yeah, but I'm just saying, this is not my field. I, I'm not, I don't really host it. I don't private, basically. Jazakallah. Uh, and then... I taught high level. I mean, Beginners levels is not my field. High level, I taught yeah, some people, just one person is a really high level. Exactly. Uh, and someone is asking, are you going to do any classes in Ramadan? Yeah, there will be classes in Ramadan, inshallah. Ramadan, Allah wa'alam what's going to happen. I think it's going to be locked down as well here. Now. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sheikh, uh, I have uh, just a couple of questions. The first one is, Sheikh, is it um, uh, authentic from Abdullah ibn Masood radiyallahu an about uh, him believing the Mu'addatayn are ad'iyya rather than actual text of the Qur'an? 
Uh, it's true, that is. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud is not. The and if you could just clarify that for us, Sheikh, uh, that's the first yeah, one. I think you've read enough and you know the answer for that. So I would say that he knows it is, but it doesn't mean anything. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, as we explain, he is of the great companions. He had missed lots of things. For example, in the ruku, he put his hands in between his legs instead of putting him onto his knees because he thinks and he said this is the sunnah um yeah, abdullah ibn masud radiallahu an also is is being used by abu hanifa to say that he does not raise up his hands except for the kibbutz al-ihram which is true which is true and it's authentic because some of the companions doesn't know what other companions need you understand me so what, that's what i just said at the beginning one takes affirmative takes precedence of all the negation so Abdullah Masood, he said, uh, he there is not, not from the Quran, these are the ones that are from the Quran. Abdullah Masood, he said, he did not make takbir of the, the companion said, there is takbir. Which one I take? Because Abdullah Masood maybe saw him in one prayer, but the other one says that there saw him in another prayer, where well, he made takbir. He made the raf'u al-yadayn, sorry, raising of the hands. And also on the, on the knees, he didn't know that it was a sunnah at the beginning to put it between the legs, but later on the Prophet Allah, he made it on the knees. <laughs> no. So that's, that's, okay. uh, that's, uh, that's no problem with the companion. Some of the Jundum used to sell alcohol. And we take him as well to go and sell alcohol now. Some of the Jundum, but he didn't know that the Prophet Allah cursed him with that. So these people are using this uh, to say that, uh, look, these two Mu'awwadateen is not from the Quran, the Quran is not correct and all of this. It's rubbish. And there's lots of refutation regarding this. And as I said, in its, this is a field in itself, a lecture. So it's not elaboration of a question of one minute or two minutes to uh, have it. It's more than that. But this is in general. As in companions, it doesn't mean that he knows everything. But the consensus of the companions are our deen. But one companion says something, or he didn't know about something, that's normal. Normal. No, I'm sure. That links to my second question, Sheikh, where you mentioned the, the consensus of the companions. Sheikh, that hadith, uh, because, is that now is that mainly restricting to the companions now? Because there wasn't really an ijma after the times of the companions where maybe every single person agreed or can that actually be used for even the future like after the companions if the salaf they no, agreed upon no, something no, the agreement the consensus is only for the companions prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said these companions you can't as the imam ahmad he said and other imams he said how can they claim there is ijma they, they, they have different you could never imagine any ijma consensus except in the companions era. No other ijma because their ijma is to be infallible. As the ijma of these companions, where is the ijma of this? You could never imagine any ijma except for the ijma of the companions. Now, let me just please uh, give a conclusion for this. There is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had sent down Quran to be recited until the day of resurrection. And also, <coughs> will wipe off maybe the wounds that take place in the Battle of Uhud. And maybe as well will take away the grief and the sorrow. Allah Azza wa Jal, he said, Surah Ali Imran, verse 137 to verse 142. There was Sunan of those people before you, nations. So walk on the land, travel in the land, and see what happened to the people who had delight. And it's belied the prophets. This is a clear proof for the people. And it is guidance and it is a reminder for the pious people. Do not be grieving or do not be humiliation. Do not be in sorrow. You are the upper, you are the ones who are on the top if you are true believers. If you're being struck with a calamity, which is the wounds and all of that, these other ones on the other side, they have struck, been struck with the same thing. And these, you know, the battles, we will make it one day for you, one day is against you. So that Allah will know who is the one amongst you who is believers, and he will take from you martyrs. And Allah does not, Love does not, he hates or he dislikes, he's not like the ones who are wrongdoers. And also to test the believers and also to destroy the disbelievers. You think they're going to enter paradise 
without Allah knowing from you who is going to be striving and who is the one who is going to be patient. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is in the last verses. And also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Ali Imran, the, the verses before that, he linked the battle to something else. It's amazing, which is riba. Allah said, Ya you alladina amanu la ta'kulu riba abu'afa mudafa. Oh, you who believe, do not devour the riba. Abu'afa mudafa. That means a lot of it. It doesn't mean little bit is halal, but usually the one who takes riba, he takes it always what? Allah. Allah alakum to fihun and fear Allah so that you will be successful. And fear the fire and be aware of the fire which has been prepared for the disbelievers and obey Allah and his messenger that you will be uh, 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 merciful so I'm asking what is the hikmah in basically uh, uh, mentioning the riba in such a place which is talking about the battle basically the jihad in sabilillah fighting for the sake of Allah is in need of money and also the need of the soul so two things are two elements the body, the souls, and also the money. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted that like you prepare your soul to fight for the sake of Allah, to be pure and to be sincere. Also, your money has to be pure. So the money for the jihad has to be from pure sources. Just like we are have to purify our intention in the jihad, and we are fighting only for the sake of Allah, we need to purify our money as well to be clean for the sake of Allah. And I'm telling those people, who are uh, uh, purchasing houses through riba, through mortgages, to fear Allah Azza wa Jal, or verily if the zina and the riba is to be uppermost or to be prevalent, then wait for a destruction. Prophet said, if the riba, the, uh, uh, the, the, the usury, riba, they call it riba, riba is a better word, interest. And that is the zina, which is the fornication, had been prevalent, in any village, then they have made the punishment of Allah to be more deserving to them. So Allah will be as well punishing them. Also, Allah had declared a war in the book of Allah, in the Quran. We did not declare any war against anyone as much as he had declared a war against the one who takes riba. Allah said, Ya ayyuhal ladina amanu attaqullaha wa ma ittaqullaha wa daru ma baqiya min riba in kuntum mu'in. O you who believe, uh, fear Allah and leave what remains for you, for, leaves what, uh, what what is from the riba? What remains for you from the riba? Leave it. You don't want the riba. In kuntum, if you are believers, if you don't do it, then you take a, a notice of war being declared upon you by Allah and His Messenger. Why in tuktu farkum walikum la tadlimuna wa la tadlamun? But he said, "Dirham riba ashadu inda Allah min sitti ma talatina zamiya." Taking one deriva, dirham into riba, while you know that it is a riba, it is worse in the sight of Allah than fornicating to be sincere. Prophet said, Al riba is riba is 70 doors or more, or 73, 73 gates, almost. The, the least of it, the minimum of it, and yankiha rajulu unna, and the person fornicates his mother. And that's a hadith which has been authenticated our Sheikh al Bani in Sahih al Bani. So that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He wanted to make sure that just like they've been prepared for the battle with their sincere and sincerity of their intention, also they have to be prepared with their pure money. And the person has to clean his money, clean his sources, Allah ta'ala alam. By this, we just say, Sayyidakallah khayra for listening. Our class will be, inshallah, tomorrow. Tomorrow at 5 o'clock, we will be uh, making a class of the people who started the prayer. We're going to make, tomorrow there's a class which is the, sh the small book of the prayer, which is the abbreviated one, which is very good for you if you want to start with that as well. That is 5 o'clock, and then after that, there's another class, which is Al-Adab Al-Mufrad in Pakla Masjid. So that will be through Zoom as well, the same number. Uh, ID number Subhanakallah and Bihamdik Ashad al Laylad Astaghfiruka wa Tugul Exakumullah wa Barakallah. By the way, uh, if you were somebody who wanted to take a permission later on of uh, recording, you should have told me and I could just click on him and give you permission to record. I think, I, I think I've done, I've, I've given everybody permission to record this session. If you have a permission to record it, it will be giving me much more time for myself rather than to go and 
take this file and then downsize it and compress it and then put it in the, the WhatsApp and then send it to you guys. It takes me time, a lot of time. So I've given it to you the opportunity now, from now and today as well, that is to record it. Who has recorded it, by the way? Anybody want to tell me to record it? Who had taken advantage of this? Maybe you didn't know about it. Sheikh, it, it wasn't working. I tried doing it. It didn't work. Oh my God. Oh, Lord. Yeah, it's, it's, it said you need permission from the host. And uh, it, it, it maybe uh, we talked about it earlier, but it didn't work. It didn't work. Huh? Subhanallah. You should have told me. You could have just. Allah. Never mind. I recorded it. I'll send it to you. Salam alaikum.